Kentucky's second road trip of their SEC slate comes against a team that was regarded as one of the best in the SEC to begin the season, but they've been kind of sliding as of late. You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on into Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can make every moment more, and right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be previewing Kentucky basketball's matchup with the Texas A&M Aggies. What do we know about the Aggies? What do they, they do well? What do they struggle with? And how can the Wildcats attack? This is the second game of the SEC slate on the road. Another really difficult one, according to Ken Palm. Going to break this one down and give our score predictions. Also, at the very end of the show, going to talk a little bit about Zvonimir Ivasic, give you an update there. Just ridiculous things happening with Big Z. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. Want to remind everyone out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the show. If you're listening on podcast, I would really appreciate it if you subscribed there as well. So let's go ahead and get into it. Kentucky versus Texas A&M. This one's going to be a big one for the Cats to prove that they can actually continue to get it done on the road. First game against the Florida Gators, somewhat comparable when you look at A&M and UF in the Kim Palm ratings. Uh, kind of similar, I think, where they hover around that 35-36 line right now uh, in the overall rankings. But Texas A&M stylistically is a very different team I think on both sides of the ball, we'll talk about their strengths, their weaknesses, and then talk about how I think Kentucky matches up with some of their individual players. We'll start here with what Kentucky, or excuse me, Texas A&M does very well. And we've talked about this on a few episodes leading up to this point. The Texas A&M Aggies, better than anybody in the country, grab offensive rebounds, and then they score second chance points off of those, you go and look at a couple of guys that have been really strong for them in that department so far this year. Anderson Garcia, one of the guys they rotate in at power forward, averages 8.7 rebounds per game in total and leads the team with 63 total offensive rebounds already this season. He's been a really solid player for them. Got to see him in person just a couple of weeks ago playing uh, in, in an SEC game, uh, no less very aggressive uh, when it comes to boxing out and, and just trying to die for the ball, very physical are the Texas A&M Aggies on both ends of the floor. They will fight tooth and nail for every single rebound, no matter what. And Garcia has been leading the charge for them so far this year. I'm really looking at possibly if a Duthiero could come back in this one, being somebody that can maybe offset Garcia just a little bit. I'm curious to see how Justin Edwards could also handle him, handle him down low. And if Kentucky's really going to be able to kind of pull this one out in College Station, they're going to need their bigs to rebound consistently. Trey Mitchell had a great outing last time he was on the court. Aaron Bradshaw had a really solid second half of, as well. I need to see more consistency from both of these guys rebounding the basketball when they're out there. It's not like they're bad rebounders, but taking some aggression out here against the Aggies would really go a long way in showing what, uh, what the, uh, the Wildcats can do in SEC play. So Anderson Garcia, their lead rebounder, then Henry Coleman the third who, if I'm not mistaken, was previously at Michigan State, transferred in to Texas A&M a few years ago. He's been here for a while now, averages 8.4 rebounds per game in total. So Garcia and Henry Coleman, two physical forwards down low, not the tallest guys. Coleman and Garcia listed at six foot eight and six foot seven, I believe, respectfully. Uh, but two guys that will be um, just really, really pushing, uh, pushing the point here. Uh, trying to grab as many rebounds as possible. Got to see AM in person again. Very, very aggressive. There's no other way to describe it. Just really physical and will wear you down as the game progresses. The other thing that Texas AM does really, really well is they get to the free throw line. According to Kim Palm, right now, Texas AM, in terms of point distribution, which is just your percentage of points that you get from three, from two, 
And from the free throw line, for example, if I score 100 points and I get 25 of those from the free throw line, my point distribution percentage for free throws is 25% uh, of le- at least of my points. So free throws for the Texas A&M Aggies so far, they've been getting 22.3% of their points from the charity stripe. That is good for top 45 in the country. That's pretty dang good. And per field goal attempt, uh, they get to the foul line quite a bit as well. So they re- rebound the basketball. They get to the foul line very, very well. And the guy that does that for them is Wade Taylor, their lead guard, who is used on almost 31% of possessions for the Aggies. Used as in he takes a shot, he has an assist, he grabs a rebound, he does something for them. He also has a pretty high assist rate as well. We're going to talk about the things that A&M does not do well here in, in a second, but Wade Taylor is not the most efficient guard, and we'll break that down in a second, but he is their lead guy. 17.3 points per game, averages four assists per game, 2.4 steals, um, has been the the guy. He was the preseason SEC player of the year, and he's somebody to be uh, respected when it comes to the style of his game, his ability to get downhill. Again, aggressive. Texas A&M likes to really push the envelope, get down to the rim, make something happen draw a foul, get to the free throw line, put up a shot that can possibly be rebounded. These guys do not quit. Wade Taylor, the guy that you want to see out there if you're Texas A&M at the foul line. Henry Coleman the third, also somebody that's not that bad of a free throw shooter, actually above average as a forward and uh, gets to the foul line a quite, a bit, quite a bit as well. Texas A&M protects the rim relatively well, only 2.7 blocks per game, which is not high but they're 63rd nationally in two-point field goal percentage. Again, this goes back to the physicality, the nature of their play on the defensive end. They really do just hound everyone whenever they get into the paint. Curious to see how guys like Trey Mitchell handle this, how Kentucky offensively will want to operate within this against Texas A&M. I I think that post-ups will be interesting to see in the first half. Will they be successful? Does Kentucky go back to them? Yada, yada, yada. We talked about that on a recent episode. I think actually the Florida recap, if I'm not mistaken, had a lot of success in the first half. Kentucky kept going back to it in the second, was not working. And even after it wasn't working, Kentucky still went back to it. So I'm curious to see what Kentucky's looking like down there. If they're going to try and match the physicality of Texas A&M with some more physicality and and see how that clash works. So uh, Texas A&M grabs offensive rebounds, gets to the foul line, Protects the rim relatively well. And then the other thing I think that they they do well, they create steals. Wade Taylor, again, 2.4 steals per game. As a team, Texas A&M on defense is top 40, or excuse me, top 50 in steal percentage. Almost 12% of possessions. So the Aggies do play with some pretty pretty interesting stats here. And the, the thing that you would expect with all of this aggression is that they play with a little bit of pace. They actually are one of, if not the slowest team in the SEC. They're 320th in the country out of 363 teams in adjusted tempo. So they've got a lead guard. They've got a couple of forwards that are very aggressive for them. They've got some role players that are interesting on top of that. A couple of them have been injured recently. And they they just kind of make you, they, they make you fight for it. And that's what you're going to see in this uh, this league. That's what you see in this conference night in and night out. Every game is going to be some type of dogfight. And this is a team that is no exception. There is no exception to this here with Texas A&M. So that's what they do well in my mind. We're going to get to what they don't do well here in just a second. Before I do that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapping up but there is still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book because new customers right now get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use and there's so many different ways to bet like live same game uh, game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab and you can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, it's the best place to find some of the most popular parlays out there that you may want to take a look at. Obviously, with the NFL playoffs coming up, you can see a lot of different ones there. Uh, that would be really fun to try out. There's more on top of that. You need to visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. Again, that is FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet a layup with FanDuel, an official partner 
of the NFL. All right, continuing along here on the Friday edition of Locked On Kentucky, Lance Daw hanging out here with you. Really appreciate you making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. Want to remind everyone out there again, we are free and available on all platforms, whether you are watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you are tuned in, please subscribe to the show. It would be greatly appreciated. And I would appreciate you joining uh, joining the bandwagon here. Got a lot of uh, got a lot of subs recently joining in, seeing what's going on with Kentucky basketball. Would love to have you on. For those of you that have been listening and watching for quite some time, appreciate you as well. Let me know what you think about this game. Give us a final score prediction in the YouTube comments below or on the socials on Twitter at Locked On UK. Give me a score prediction here. So the Texas A and M Aggies they do some things really well, and they're very aggressive, very physical. What do they not do? Well, well, for starters, this team is not uh, particularly efficient from the floor. So as we mentioned again in previous episodes, the Texas A&M Aggies were one of the best offenses in the country, according to Kim Palm, in terms of adjusted efficiency. And it was mainly because of their offensive rebounding percentage. They get about 45% of their misses, which is insane. And so that led to a really high adjusted efficiency. They were top five in the country at one point. They have now fallen to 26th. Why is that? Well, Texas A&M is on a little bit of a slide as of late, and a lot of it has to do with their offense bogging down. They simply cannot keep up rebounding the basketball and getting these second-chance points when they just can't really shoot as a whole. And it really does stink to see a team like this that is so good in one aspect not be able to capitalize consistently on their offensive rebound percentage. You look at some of their losses recently to Virginia, scored 47 points in that game against Memphis, who at times, if I'm not mistaken, has had a little bit of a leaky defense this year, 75 points in an 81 to 75 loss. Houston, 66 points. LSU, that was a game, I believe Texas A&M was predicted to, uh, projected to win by 11, 11 and a half, and they ended up losing that game by 15 at home. They scored 55 points on the road against Auburn. They're not shooting the basketball well, even though they're grabbing some of these misses. And the guy that has been leading the charge for them, Wade Taylor, again, averaging over 17 a game, has been one of the guilty parties here. 36%. That's what he's shooting from the floor. Not from three, from the floor. He's shooting 25.5% from beyond the arc. Those numbers simply won't cut it. As a team, Texas A&M is shooting less than 41%, almost 40% from the floor, and then 26% from three. Those numbers, respectfully, are 200, excuse me, 355th nationally, and then 230th nationally. Those are bad numbers. Those are really, really inefficient numbers. And thank goodness they rebound the basketball as well as they do. Otherwise, they would not be able to really sustain a whole lot of offense, and they're only averaging 73 points per game right now. So this is a team, I feel like, that could be better. And they will have nights where they go ballistic on some SEC teams because they can rebound the ball and they just hit their shots. It's just a hot shooting night. I hope that's not what happens against the Wildcats tomorrow evening, but it could be. Excuse me, it's it's like mid-afternoon. It could be what happens to UK. So your lead guard, inefficient. Your offense as a whole cannot shoot the basketball. And then something else that concerns me a little bit about Texas A&M, if I am an Aggies fan, is the fact that they don't match up physically, or excuse me, not physically, they match up very well physically. Uh, Their height, I think there's a big discrepancy here in the rotation. Because you've got Rob Dillingham and DJ Wagner at 6'4". You've got Antonio Reeves who can match up with Hayden Hefner at 6'6". Hayden Hefner is probably one of the better shooters uh, on this squad as a whole. Trey Mitchell, I think, can go up against Henry Coleman, guys like Jace Carter, guys like Anderson Garcia. I think he can do that just fine. I think that Justin Edwards can also bear a little bit of a, ro- a, a load against a guy like Tyrese Radford, who we didn't even talk about. It's been a solid player for them for years. Um, not Again, not shooting the best is uh, is Tyrese Radford, only shooting 26.5% from three, just like Wade Taylor. Um, but those are guys in that rotation for, for Texas A&M listed at just looking down the, the list here of percentage of possessions used. Not even, I'm not even going to include names. Six foot, six four, six six. 6'3", 6'5", 6'8", 6'6", 6'7", 6'7", and then their least utilized player is 6'11". 
Compare that to Kentucky at 6'3", 6'6", 6'4", 6'9", 6'3", 6'8", 7'1", 6'8", 7'8". So you've got guys across the board here. You've got two seven-footers, and then you've got a guy in Trey Mitchell that I think can match up with Henry Coleman. Texas A&M does not have height. They don't have pace like Kentucky does. They don't shoot well, and their lead guy is putting up a lot of shots And not a lot of them are going down. The the stat I actually didn't even throw out is that Wade Taylor has taken 228 shots this season. The next closest player is Hayden Hefner at 120. He's taken over 100 shots more than the next closest player on roster, which is insane. So how does Kentucky attack it? What does Kentucky got to do in order to get the win here on the road against the Texas A&M Aggies? Well, for starters... I think Kentucky has to hit their outside shots. And obviously, any team can get hot at any point. Texas A&M could easily walk into this game shooting 26% like they are, not hitting a single thing, hitting the backboard sometimes, just throwing it into the stands on occasion. And they could come out and they could be touching nothing but nylon with all of their shots. And then Kentucky could just be on the other end just missing everything as one of the better three-point teams in the nation. That could happen. Who knows? But I think the big matchup here is how Kentucky allows the the pace of Texas A&M to to affect them and whether or not they are able to take and make their outside shots. The most recent contest I said against Missouri, hey, Kentucky's got speed. Missouri's a little sluggish on the defensive end. They can drive. They can score at the rim pretty effectively. I think Kentucky may have a little bit more of a difficult time doing that against Texas A&M. And so I think some of these more, more uh, I think Kentucky's got to get a little bit more aggressive from beyond the arc. And if they can hit their shots, it's going to prevent Texas A&M from winning this game. It could be a very competitive game. It could be back and forth. This game could go to OT, for all we know. I think it's a 50-50 matchup because of the home environment, because of you don't know what you're going to get night in and night out from an SEC team. Look, this is a squad that has scored almost jack against two SEC opponents for back-to-back games, 53 and 55 points, one of those games being at home. And you could say, man, this offense stinks. They aren't doing anything right now, and they could turn right back around and score 80 against t- uh, Kentucky tomorrow. It could happen. That's how this league works. That's how college basketball works. But if we're doing this based off of which team can shoot, which team can survive in the rebounding margin, which team has better guard play? I think it's Kentucky. I think it's Kentucky. And I know I initially said at the beginning of my SEC predictions that Kentucky loses this game. The way Texas A&M has played over these past two games does give me pause. Because initially I thought Texas A&M was just going to be able to take advantage of the matchup and their offense was going to be fine. Now I'm seeing it after seeing it in person and after you know, looking at how this has been, how this is going, saying, okay, they've got pieces. They could win this game by 30 for all we know. But but Kentucky, I, they're, they're due for another hot shooting night. They're due for another hot shooting night, even if, excuse me, even if it is on the road. And I hope that's the case. Knock on wood, I hope that's the case. So I'm going to take Kentucky to win this game. Ken Palm has the winner of this game scoring 79 points. They give Kentucky a 51% chance to win. I don't think this game gets into the high 70s unless there are free throws being had. I don't think anybody gets over 77. I'm going to say Kentucky wins this game. Let's go 76-72. Kentucky takes it by four on the road against a decent Texas A&M squad who I think can be better. And who knows? They may show us that they're better than their 9-6 record and their sluggish offense over the past two games. Maybe they show us tomorrow. I think Kentucky hitting these outside shots with their guards. Reed Shepard, DJ Wagner, Rob Dillingham. You you cannot shut off Rob Dillingham in this game. Just really hoping he does not go completely cold. And then Antonio Reeves cannot shut down on the road. He's got to be able to get his in this one as well. If you've got any thoughts, final score predictions, you can leave those in the YouTube comments below. All right, I got one more thing to talk about. One more thing to talk about with Kentucky, and we are back on the Zavonimir Ivasic train. Ladies and gentlemen, Oh my goodness, the saga never ends. Before we get into that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at Game Time. Let's say somehow you're in the College Station area and you want to get a ticket to 
this game tomorrow. Maybe you're watching this on Saturday and you are in the area. You're trying to get some last minute tickets. Well, game time is the place for you. You should not have to worry when trying to buy tickets to your next big event, whether it is at the last moment or weeks in advance. And game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all different kinds of events in your area, sports, music, comedy, and theater. They've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. You go to their app, you can see Pictures of your seats, you can see very clearly up front what the price of the tickets is going to be. Again, all different kinds of events, not just sporting events, but I used it quite a bit this past college football season for different college football games. Loved using game time. Really easy, really quick. You can get tickets in a second. You can sometimes get tickets, I believe, up to an hour after the game starts on different events. Really, really cool stuff that game time has going on over there. Take the guesswork out of buying your tickets with game time. You can download the app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest priced, guaranteed. All right, wrapping up the Friday edition of Locked On Kentucky. So we got some news here. Regarding Zvonimir Ivasic, he returned home to Croatia over the Christmas break to be with his family, stayed a little longer than originally anticipated, stayed through the Illinois State game. He has returned to Kentucky, happy to be back, happy to be growing, happy to be developing with this squad, and he's been sitting on the bench waiting for the NCAA to do something. Give him eligibility. Don't give him eligibility. Do something. Just give us an answer. Well, recently, Coach Cal hopped on a podcast of some former coach. Doesn't really matter who it was. But apparently, he had some things to say to this former head coach about Big Z and stipends he received while playing with his Croatian professional team before coming to Kentucky. That is the holdup, according to Cal, That's what's got the NCAA with their panties in a wad right now. Stipends that he got from Croatia. So you may say, oh, man, that must be a few thousand dollars or something like that to play for a professional Croatian team, right? It's got to be. According to Coach Cal, and I'll quote him directly here, he, Ivasic, made a stipend, and you're the NCAA saying it was too much of a stipend. Juniors in high school and seniors in high school are making hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you're talking about his $200, a stipend of 200 is too much or 300, whatever it was. We've got to move on with the times and what's going on right now. Coach Cal said the stipend he got paid to play for a, for a Croatia, two to 300 bucks. That is what the NCAA is held up over. If this is true, and it's coming from the head man himself on a podcast of former Duke head coach, Mike uh, Krzyzewski, this is, and I hope I pronounce his name right. Nobody knows how to pronounce Mike's name right. Coach K's name. This is insane. That that, that, That is genuinely insane. The fact that not only are they refusing to do anything about it, they are sitting on their hands, but it's such... A ridiculous thing. Two to three hundred dollars. Two to three hundred bucks, and we have been waiting months after the the Kentucky's uh, admissions office cleared him. Months for the NCAA to finally do this. We've seen other players in this sport and outside of it get cleared for worse. They, fine, come on in. Whatever. Two kids at UCLA were able to get in after after coming in from overseas. And, and, and Ivasic is just sitting here, by the way, sick as a dog and losing this weight here while being sick, still somehow managing to uh, get a 3.5 GPA despite most people apparently thinking he can't speak English. I mean, this, this is insane what's going on. The NCAA, we're, ha- we're almost halfway through January 
And there, there has been nothing, absolutely nothing. And I swear, it's. It, I, I really do hope, I really do hope that we get through this and we do get him approved. Because if we go this entire season without him getting an answer, period, you're you're gonna see some you're gonna see some locked on Kentucky hate for the NCAA, uh, like you've not seen yet. Because it it, it frankly it, it is just bizarre that they cannot do anything in a in a in a in a quick and timely manner. It is embarrassing that they can't do it. Goodness gracious, what are we going to do? Well, apparently we're going to play with Trey Mitchell, Aaron Bradshaw, and you got Onyenso. Maybe that will be enough. Maybe it will be enough. It'd be nice. Be nice to have Big Z, but just hope he gets approved. Hope he's doing okay. All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore and follow the show on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave those in the YouTube comments below. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless.